Hello, John here again. Uh, we're going to be talking about the second part of our um, medical assessment is going to be the primary assessment. Remember, you have uh, to complete this primary assessment within one minute. You have to do the assessment. Now, any interventions, that's going to be a little bit different, but the actual assessment itself must be completed within one minute. Now, the first part of our primary is our general impression. As you walk into the room, as you approach your patient, we haven't made official contact yet, but we're approaching our patient. We're going to start to make our general impression. This sets the mood of the call. First of all, we're going to get an approximate age. By looking at approximate age, this can kind of determine some questions. Do I see an approximately 90-year-old female, or do I see a 5-year-old child? Okay. So approximate age, possible com uh, chief complaint. Now, with possible chief complaint, if I see a 90-year-old male sitting on a chair holding their chest, a safe assumption of a possible complaint could be chest pain. Obviously, it can change, but this can kind of help determine what kind of questions I'm going to need to ask. Uh, as I mentioned, so approximate age, sex, and the status. Now, as far as status, are they mild, moderate, or acute? Okay, when I say mild, moderate, or acute, is the patient just sitting there looking at you? Is the patient unconscious? Do you see obvious bleeding? How ill or injured do they really look? And then the environment. As I walk into the room, do I see anything with the environment that can help me lead to what happened to the patient? or any type of background information, such as if I walk into a bedroom, do I see any diabetes-related materials, such as a glucometer, a Sharps container, insulin bottles? Do I see anything that could lead me to suspect what's going on? In regards to the next part, after and level of consciousness, we're going to assess how awake, how physically awake our patient is. So they're alert, they respond to verbal, painful, and they're unresponsive. Now, as far as the level of consciousness, we can start incorporating a GCS. Now, as I walk up to my patient, if I see that their eyes are closed, I can start some verbal stimuli, and if they don't respond to my verbal, I can immediately go into my painful stimuli as I walk up to them. Now, you have to understand, if your patient is found unresponsive, you need to immediately check a pulse, right? So going back to our CPR guidelines, the second you find out your patient is unresponsive, immediately check for a pulse, is CPR indicated for this patient? If not, well, then we can continue on. From here, we can establish our chief complaint. It says chief complaint. CC is chief complaint. This is only one. We're going to choose the worst thing of what's going on. So for my unresponsive patient, their chief complaint is going to be unresponsive. Now, we're going to establish any life threats. A life threat can be described as profuse vomiting. Uh, in their airway. We have an amputation to the arm. We have profuse bleeding, something that they can kill the patient within the next several seconds. We're going to address that right away. If I see minimal abrasions, if I see a, a hematoma to the head, we're going to go ahead and skip that for now. This is only a life threat. Now, we're going to move on to our ABCs. In regards to airway, first of all, we're going to open the airway. We're either going to use a head tilt chin lift or a jaw thrust maneuver based on if I'm considering spine immobilization. If I am considering spine immobilization, we're gonna use a jaw thrust maneuver. If this is purely a medical patient and no spine considerations are uh, being considered, we're gonna go ahead and use a head tilt chin lift. We're gonna clear the airway. Do I see any obstructions in the airway? When you open that airway, look inside, what do you see? Do I need to suction? Do I need to remove any foreign bodies? We're gonna go ahead and support and secure the airway at this time. Remember, support. We support an airway with a nasal pharyngeal airway or an oral pharyngeal airway. We're going to secure the airway with either a King airway device or possibly an advanced airway that we called for additional resources, advanced life support. Okay, so support. Support, remember that the patient can still aspirate if they vomit with an OPA or NPA in place. This is why it's only supporting. Securing means that the patient's airway is completely secured. Nothing's going to get in or out besides air. Breathing, we're going to look at rate, tidal volume, O2 sat. Remember, rate and tidal volume, we have to look at those two items. Rate and tidal volume both equally have to be adequate in order for the patient to have a passive oxygen delivery device, such as a nasal cannula, non-rebreather, or CPAP device. Those are passive devices. The patient has to be able to draw air in. So rate and tidal volume, if any one of these are abnormal, you're going to have to possibly assist ventilations using a BVM. Possibly use a BVM to assist ventilations. O2 sat. We're going to go ahead and check an O2 sat. Now remember with an O2 sat, 
This could be variable on patients. We are going to treat our patient. Treat our patient. This is one piece of the puzzle. Now, once we determine that oxygen is going to be indicated, we need to choose the correct delivery device. For a patient that has adequate rate and tidal volume, but it's increased, we can possibly go to a non-rebreather. For somebody that has an adequate rate and tidal volume, and it's more of a milder case of shortness of breath, we could possibly use a nasal cannula. So you're going to have to assess that rate and tidal volume very specifically. Moving on to circulation, with bleeding, we're going to assess for any life-threatening bleeding. If the patient has a small abrasion to their hand, to their leg, or an extremity, anywhere else, uh, laceration that's uh, very superficial, we're going to skip that. We're only looking for life-threatening bleeding at this time. Pulse, we're going to go ahead and check a patient's radial pulse and possibly even a carotid pulse. When we check for a pulse, we're going to look at rate, rhythm, and quality. Now, in regards to a rate, we're going to check, is it fast, is it slow, does it appear to be within a normal range of a rate? Don't assess an actual number. Now, the rhythm, is it a regular rhythm or is it an irregular rhythm? Now, if it's irregular rhythm, this would kind of make sense for my patient that possibly had chest pain that I found within my general pressure and established my chief complaint. Okay. Now, as far as quality, is it strong or is it weak? Okay, so is it strong, is it weak? If it's weak, that could imply that there's poor perfusion. There's some poor circulation going on. We have to figure that out, obviously. With skins, in regards to checking for skins, color, temperature, and condition. As far as color, are they pale? Are they flushed? Do they look cyanotic? Are they jaundiced? Okay. Temperature, you're going to go ahead and take your, uh, the back of your hand, and you're going to put it to their forehead or to their neck. Is it warm? Is it hot? Is it cool? Is it cold? And then condition. Are they very dry? Do they look like they're diaphoretic? Are they moist? How is the condition of their skins? Once I established my primary assessment at this time, I'm going to go ahead and prioritize my patient. What I'm going to do is, is get the information that I've obtained here as far as my chief complaint, my GCS, and my ABCs. Based on these items, we can go ahead and prioritize our patient, whether they need to be transported immediately or else we have a few minutes to stay on scene and ask some questions and figure things out. If I establish that my patient is a priority, we're going to go ahead and load the patient up and do the rest of the assessment while we're moving towards the hospital. 